verses we're going to be starting about coming, overcoming generational curses. How many of you have ever heard the phrase something like this? Well, you know, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. How about that? You know, they're just like so and so. Or just my lot in life. Or, well, you know, that's just the way it is. The same thing happened to grandpa and great grandpa and great great grandpa. So the same thing's going to happen to me. And my name is Grandpa Eeyore. We all of us have likenesses or characteristics from our families. Some good and some maybe not so good. <laughs> we have family resemblances. We have family dispositions. We have <clears throat> inherited character traits and personalities. And as we grow a little bit older, we start to notice stuff. We have inherited certain characteristics from certain relatives. We have things from our mom's side and things from our dad's side. And we'd all like to have the best from each side, wouldn't we? Well, yeah. The problem with that is some of you don't have a good side. We'll get to that. Bless God. Hallelujah. There's help for you. One of the things that's interesting, and you can check this out, in fact, you might want to, is, is, is you look at the way um, the Jewish tribes and their various assignments they had, and you'll start looking and you can start see inheritances in these groups. And as you look at the family trees, you start to begin to see generation strengths and weaknesses. And you'll begin to see patterns in our lives and things that bring out curses and blessings. I don't know if you knew this or not, but the Word of God is full of blessings and cursings. Now, I believe God wants us to be enlightened and, 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 and find out if there's some hidden causes of defeat in our families and, and root out those stubborn and entrenched blockades to victory that we have in our lives. How many of you would like to just be victorious all the time? Amen. Amen. Remember a while back we talked in Matthew 15 and 13. Matthew 15 and 13. Jesus answered and said, Every plant which my father has not planted shall be rooted up. Remember that? As we discover some truths that are in the Word of God, and here's the operative phrase, and apply it, apply it to our personal lives, we're going to start establishing within ourselves a blessing for our present and future generations until the Lord comes. I believe seriously that all of us want to live a life of abundance and uh, peacefulness and joy and fulfilling our victory in Christ Jesus all the time. I believe that's all we want to do, not only for ourselves, but also for our kids and grandkids and generations to come. How many of you know this is not rocket science? How many of you know that a coin has two sides? God is love, right? Exodus chapter 20, verse 5 says, Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, this referred to idols, nor serve them. For I, the Lord God, am a jealous God, visiting, now watch this, the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Then the other side of the coin, Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 9, Know therefore that the Lord thy God, He is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant 
and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. Do you want to be blessed? That means empowered to prosper. Or do you want to be cursed? Do you want your children to be blessed? Or do you want your children to be cursed? See? Nothing really seems to touch us more than our kids. Amen. I mean, you know, once you get over the, he's touching me on vacation, you know, you get rid of that. <laughs> Every once in a while, you know, you love your kids. I know. I, come on. I'm joking with you. Hey, Ben. Like the boy said, I didn't ask you to be born. The dad said, yeah, if you would have, the answer would have been no. <laughs> <laughs> when we give God place in our lives, we open ourselves up to the blessings. But, I said, but, if we give place to the enemy, or if you are already under a generational curse, we're asking our children then to enter into that curse and the devil is going to do everything he can to devour them. Amen. Let me give you an illustration. It's kind of interesting. Two, two American families about the same time, in fact, they live in the same general area, to illustrate the power of generational curses. There was this fellow named uh, Max Juke. He was, uh, some say, most say, he was a professing atheist, and he married a godless woman. They traced about 560 of his descendants. This is in the 19th century. 560 descendants. 310 died as paupers. 150 became criminals. Seven were murderers. A hundred were known to be drunkards. And more than half of the women were prostitutes. The descendants of Max Duke cost the United States government more than one and a quarter million dollars in 19th century dollars, which today would be about $32 million. Then there was this fellow by the name of Jonathan Edwards. You may have heard of him. He was, again, about the same time Max was around. In the same general area. He was a committed Christian, gave God first place in his life. He buried a godly young lady, and they recorded some 1,394 descendants from him. 295 graduated from college. See if there's any difference in these two. 295 graduated from college, 13 of them became college presidents, 65 became professors, three were elected as United States senators, three were state governors, others were sent as ministers to foreign countries, 30 became judges, 100 were lawyers, one became dean of an outstanding law school. 75 became officers in the military. A hundred were well-known missionaries, preachers, and prominent authors. And there were 62 physicians. 80 held some form of public office, of which three were mayors of large cities. One was the comptroller of the U.S. Treasury, and another was vice president of the United States. Not one of the descendants of the Edwards family was a liability to the government. My point is this, if we follow God, if we serve God, praying, living the word, walking in the word, staying committed to him, then our children and grandchildren then are going to grow up serving him as well. But the more you compromise, the more you lose them. Deuteronomy chapter 11, verses 26 through 28. Behold, you know when God says behold, that means pay attention. <laughs> I set before you this day a blessing and a curse. God sets it out there, a blessing, curse. A blessing if 
you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you this day, and a curse if you will not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside out of the way which I command you this day to go after other gods which you have not known. Now think about that a minute. I set before you a blessing and a cursing. A blessing if you obey me, a cursing if you don't. Duh. Hello. <laughs> Deuteronomy chapter 28, first two verses. It shall come to pass, God cannot lie, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord your God to observe, to do all his commandments which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth. Verse 2, and all these blessings shall come on you and overtake you if you hearken unto the voice of the Lord your God. Hallelujah. If I'm going to get run over, I want to get run over by a blessing, not a curse. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. What's that? BB blessing. Boom. Yippee. All right. All right. So we can all be on the same page because I like that. Sometimes, you know, in communications, some people say, you know, like it used to be, you know, keep off the grass. Now it's everybody smoking it. I, you know, I, <laughs> but it's okay. The government said it was all right. Okay. For the sake, the, the, this is a definition of generational curse. An uncleansed iniquity that increases in strength from one generation to the next, affecting the members of that family and all who come into relationship with that family. One more time. A generational curse is an uncleansed iniquity that increases in strength from one generation to the next, affecting the members of that family and all who come into relationship with that family. You were all given that little test this morning. And I can tell you this, just from my own personal experience, life experience, if you couldn't find out anything on there to hit you, Maybe you weren't reading it. <laughs> so, so what's the origin of all this? Again, this introduction. How does all start? What's the deal for crying out loud? Why is it? Why does stuff come to me? In the beginning, God created the perfect family situation. He created Adam and Eve, and He placed him in the garden. A place of total wonderful things, a utopia, so to speak. Everything taken care of. They walked and talked with God. No problems. They were blessed and walking in abundance. No problems. Hey, what's that calling on the ground? Okay, there. Yeah. Genesis chapter 1, verses 28 and 30. And God blessed them, empowered them to prosper. And God said to them, I believe, line of mock theology, I believe that right here, when it says God said unto them, I believe all earth became silent. I really do. I think the birds shut up. I think the trees quit moving in the breeze. I think everything just quiet. And God said unto them, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I've given you every herb-bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree and that which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed, to you it shall be for me. And to every beast of the earth, to every fowl of the earth, to everything that creepeth upon the earth. Don't you love you have authority over creeps? Wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat, and it was so. Now, most of you, of course, are aware of the situation that happened. They walked in the fullness of God's provision, and, and, and the enemy comes along to seize Adam. I wonder if that's why we have more women going to church than we have men. 
fascinating. But they lost their position of dominion. They lost that intimate relationship they had with God. Prior to the fall, they were blessed, but after the fall, the curse came on the earth, sin, death, destruction. And the family as God originally created it to be hasn't been the same since. And because of their transgression, Adam and Eve placed themselves under a curse that not only impacted their family, but all of the families from then on from generation to generation. Now, you may say, well, bless God, I'll just blame them. No, we're going to get to you <laughs> and your area of responsibility. And you'll be happy after you get over it. Amen. <laughs> Genesis chapter 3, verse 16. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. And sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, I'll leave it alone, and hast eaten of the tree which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake, and sorrow you shall eat of all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. Total bliss, total peace and comfort and joy to holy mackerel. Look at the mess she got me into. <laughs> Come on. That's what he said. Read your Bible. Come on. God pronounced a curse upon the serpent in the land. Adam was sentenced to a life of hard labor. Eve's pain during childbearing was increased. Adam and Eve went from a place of great abundance and prosperity and peace to a place of death, disease, fear, and destruction. Every undesirable hereditary trait which seems to run in the family has its origin in the sin of Adam and Eve. They're the foundational source of what we're going to be looking at and for some time as we go through this generational curse. If there's anything that you and I want, and I can tell you this in all sincerity, I want your families to be strong, healthy, and blessed. Amen. Yet from the beginning we see that the families have just degenerated. As we look back at Adam and Eve's tree, family tree, we discover, now watch this, they were evicted from the garden, okay? They gave birth to two sons, Cain and Abel. Cain became jealous of his brother Abel and murdered him. That's in Genesis 4. And you keep reading on, Cain's decision, uh, descendant, Lamech, followed in his forefather's footsteps, and he also murdered somebody. That's also Genesis 4, 23. Now watch. There's a definite hereditary trait that passed on from one generation to another. Now let's go back to Exodus 20 and 5 again, where we can find this, this, this it's, it's actually a very profound truth that we can look at these hereditary traits or these family weaknesses that are passed on from generation to generation. And I can tell you now, I wouldn't be sharing with this with you if I didn't love you. Amen. That means you're going to get your toes stepped on before we're done with this. Boy, it got quiet. I liked the first part was amen. Then it got real quiet in here. I'll talk to these people back here. Bless God, they're on my side. Amen. Thank you very much. All right. Exodus 25, thou shalt not bow thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and to the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. I'm sure if you just think about it for a minute, everybody in here can look at some, maybe your own family, but you look at families that have been torn apart by alcoholism, 
obesity, teenage pregnancies. As we look at our own family trees, we might recognize certain patterns of diseases or certain infirmities or certain characteristics such as adultery or child abuse and think, wow, my family tree is a mess. Yes, it is. I said, yes, it is. Yes, it is. Don't panic. <laughs> God's made a provision, thank God, for you and for your future generations if you apply these things that we're going to be talking about. Isaiah 53, 12 says that Jesus bore our sins. Hallelujah. Isn't that wonderful? But it goes on to say, and it talks about other things, and it makes a distinction between the terms sin, iniquity, and transgression. Now get this. Say sin. Iniquity and transgressions. Sometimes we put it all in the same box. It's not. Okay? Isaiah 53, 5. Look what it says. But he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. When the stripes were healed. Okay, sin. Sin is the, is the in the simplest form, means miss the mark. That's what it means. So, if you sin, you miss the mark or fall below the mark of what God has called you to do. Watch this. We all have been guilty of missing the mark at some time or another. Like the word says in Romans 3, 23, we've all sinned. And by doing so, we come short of the glory. So, gee... If all of sin and come short of the glory, if we quit sinning, maybe we can get in the glory. There's a thought. Okay. So we don't have any problem. We all understand sin. Just fall short of the mark, right? Another word. Transgression or transgress. It means to trespass or overstep pre-established boundaries. We can trespass against man, and we can also trespass against God. If, if I were to come up to you, and in the natural sense, physically, step on your toes, <laughs> or you had a sign up in your yard that says, no trespassing, and I went right by it, without your permission, I would be transgressing against you. Got it? Yes. But it says in Isaiah 53, Jesus was wounded for our transgressions. If y'all know what Bible numerology is, right? I think it's fun. I don't put life and death in it, on it, but I think it's fun. That's me. Some people, boy, I'll tell you what, ooh, oh, that's okay. Go ahead. Leave your conviction, brother. Have a nice day. It is interesting, though, that Jesus' blood was shed seven times, which in Bible numerology is completeness or fullness, right? Watch this. Circumcised at birth, his beard was plucked. There's all times he shared the blood. Crown of thorns pressed on his head. His hands were pierced. Feet were pierced. Side was pierced. His back was beaten. Seven. Seven times he shared blood, the number of completion. I believe that God was showing that it, Jesus has completely provided for every, every kind of weakness, infirmity, and transgression. Because he took seven wounds for us. You can truly say that the provision of Jesus Christ is full and totally complete. Okay, we've talked about sin, transgression. Next one, iniquity. This is the biggie. It means to bend or distort the heart. 
Get the phrase, bend or distort the heart. It also implies a certain weakness or predisposition towards a certain sin. Isaiah 53, 5 says that he was, watch the phrase, bruised for our iniquities. For instance, if you commit a sin once and repent of it, never do it again, it's, that's it. No problem. However, your sin then becomes an iniquity if, if you do it, keep on doing it, keep on keeping on. Amen. It goes from being a sin to an iniquity. An iniquity is the same sin over and over and over and over. And remember the definition, bend or distort the heart. Get a hold of this. Something that's practiced over and over again and eventually it just becomes spontaneous and given certain circumstances of the right environment, you will bend in that direction. If a sin is re repeated over and over, it eventually becomes an iniquity, and that is what's passed down through the bloodline. When a person continually transgresses the law, iniquity is created in him, and then iniquity is passed on to the children, and the offspring will have a weakness for that same kind of sin. Each generation then does what? They add to it. Further weakening the resistance to be able to stand against it. On down to the generations. Because we read in Exodus 25, it speaks very specifically about the iniquity of the fathers. If the family tree is not cleansed of the iniquity, then each generation will become worse and worse and worse and will do what their parents, grandparents, and great-grandparents do, period. The next generation will bend the very same way the previous generation did and it becomes a bond of iniquity or a generational curse in that family. I'm sure most of you have, have seen where maybe folks you know, one or both parents uh, or grandparents were alcoholics. I never was an alcoholic because I never had to go to those meetings. <laughs> okay. And then lo and behold, one of the offspring becomes an alcoholic. Gee. And to think it all started as a sin with that one person who overindulged, but because they practiced it and practiced it and practiced it, did not repent, but kept on doing it, their drinking, their sin then became an iniquity, which is passed on from generation to generation. And bless God, that's why it's easier for the kids of alcoholic parents to become alcoholics themselves. Because it's passed down from generation. I'm not giving you any excuses because there's a way out of this, but I'm telling you that's how it happens. Every one of us has somebody in our family tree that's a dork. Amen. <laughs> there was this uh, particular individual who was a Christian, strong Christian. And, and her, this lady's father had two nervous breakdowns. They didn't know later, until later, but his father had mental problems and emotional problems. They never thought that could be an inherited trait or something that they had a predisposition towards. This person, whenever, this strong Christian now, strong Christian, this is important. Whenever 36 years old, 
this person became under a lot of pressure. They were in ministry. A lot of pressure in ministry for some people. And the enemy spoke to them and said, you look and act just like your father. You're going to have a nervous breakdown just like he did. This strong Christian foolishly said, yes, I'm just like my father. I'm going to have a nervous breakdown too. My purpose is let that just sit there for a minute. But God spoke to her. Hallelujah. God spoke to her and said, that's right. You're just like your father. I'm your father. I've never had a nervous breakdown, and you won't either. Hallelujah. He was bruised for our iniquities. Through the wounds and the bruises he endured for us on the cross, he provided for us to restore us and our family to that state of blessedness that Adam and Eve had way back in the garden. Amen. Now, there's a difference, again, between, that's why this is all important to understand the foundation of it, the difference between a wound and a bruise. If you wound yourself, you know what? I cut myself the other day and I bled. I know you may find that hard to believe. <laughs> I, was, I was at a hospital visitation one time. I was wandering around trying to find them. Some lady comes up to me and says, what are you doing here? Uh, I'm visiting somebody. Yeah, because you preach healing. What are you doing here? Because I'm visiting somebody. Ignorance is as ignorant does. Okay. <laughs> Amen. If I'm sick and I, I can't get on top of it, I go to what's known as the doctor, folks. <laughs> Duh. <laughs> but this person, I forgot to ask them what they were doing there. <laughs> now, the difference between a wound and a bruise, you, you, you cut yourself, wound yourself, and eventually it's going to scab over, right? But a bruise can stick around for a long time. It, it may become discolored, and, and if you ever really banged yourself, it go all the way to the bone. An iniquity can be compared to a bruise because it stays around and it goes to the bone from generation to generation to generation. He was bruised for our iniquities. <clears throat> wow. In fact, the Apostle Paul had a revelation of that. In second, second, I'm speaking of King James this morning, second of Thessalonians, second, see if we got it right up there, it is, second Thessalonians 2 7. Got my tongue in front of my eye teeth, couldn't see what I was saying. For the mystery of iniquity, doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. So Paul had a, had a revelation of this iniquity and how to deal with it because he was bruised for our iniquities. But I'm out of time. I'm not finished. I'm just out of time today. We're going to pick it up right here next time. Okay? Don't miss a one of them because we're going to really dig into this generational curses. And I would really recommend, if you have not taken the test, to do so.